You look marvelous. It's really uh, fantastic to be here. I, I, it's honestly an honor and a privilege uh, and a joy. I love this uh, switching uh, pulpits. Uh, Bruxy's down at Woodland Hills Church right now, and I'm up here. I'm sure my church gets the better deal, but it's, uh, it's fun. <laughs> just the variety is really good. I, I just am having such a good time um, I, hanging out with Bruxy and Tim, not just up here, but we, we uh, on uh, phone get together every so often and strategize about kind of movement going on around the world and just some different things. And so there's a, there's a, a great kind of a kinship that's being forged here. And I, I just uh, love it. So coming here, uh, it's kind of like coming to my second home. It feels very, very comfortable here, very much my tribe. I love you guys. You can tell I feel very much at home because I took my shoes off. <laughs> Slain in the spirit, the first row's all falling back. No, uh, yeah, because it, that it, it's, it's uh, not that I'm on holy ground, though no doubt this is holy ground, but... Um, as, as was said here earlier, it's at 10,000 degrees up here, and I don't know what it is about turning, I'm 56 now, and uh, in your 50s, you sweat more. Has anyone else noticed that? <laughs> I'm going through menopause, is what it is. Uh, and some say that it's, it's uh, when you have a lot of empathy with your wife, and she's going through that funky period of life, they just sort of empathize, so I, I feel bad, so bad for her getting all sweaty that I got to get sweaty too. I don't know if that's it or if it's just chemicals or what it is, but uh, so if I start sweating like a stuck pig up here, you'll know uh, that it's uh, menopause. There you go. I probably shared too much there, didn't I? Okay, well, it's, but anyways, it helps you stay cool by keeping your feet ventilated. You know that a lot of your heat is, comes from being your, these were meant to be free. Uh, shoes are unnatural. They're part of the fall. I, I say it's time. We got to declare liberation here. Let's be liberated. So this is uh, from Baptist to Anabaptist. How did I acquire the Anna? Uh, where, where did that come from? We're, we're, we're uh, starting off this series on um, the, the one church and all of its diversity, the church universal. But that immediately raises this question that I've been living in in particular for two or three years now, maybe more like five or six. And that is, how do you affirm the unity of the church while also uh, holding to, with integrity, your distinctive beliefs that aren't shared by the whole church? So here's a passage for us to launch off of. Uh, it's, it's one of the classic passages, passages about the unity of the church. It's, it's uh, in Ephesians 4, where Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, and by the way, if you want to be free, become a prisoner of the Lord. For, as, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And that doesn't mean try to earn it or anything like that. It just means live a life that's consistent with the calling that you've received, that reflects the worth of the calling that you've received. And here's what it looks like when you do that. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The reason is because there is, in the end, one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope and you were called, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, this is a passage that strongly expresses the unity of the body. There's one body, one Lord, one faith. It's got a lot of different expressions, and there's even a lot of disagreement, but in the end, there's one. So, this is a passage that strongly is telling us that if we're to reflect the, the worth of our calling... Uh, then we have to be gentle and meek and, and loving in our relationships with others in the body of Christ. And we must never separate ourselves in a sectarian way, thinking that we've got a corner on the truth. We're the righteous club, the holy club, the whole truth club, nothing but the truth. Um, that we always have to be affirming the unity of the body of Christ, make the bond of peace and the one spirit strong. But how do you do that with you're at the same time holding to things that aren't shared by the whole body, and, and you maybe are passionate about those. For example, in the Anabaptist tradition that I've grown into, I'm going to talk about how I grew into that here in a little bit, but in the Anabaptist tradition, uh, at, at the center of our understanding of the gospel is the call to love our enemies and to be nonviolent, to imitate Jesus. It's a, it's, it's a core thing. Most of the church does not agree with that. In fact, 500 years ago, most of the church were putting, was putting to death Anabaptists for believing that and some other distinctive things. We wouldn't join the state on different stuff. But 
So this, this distinctive is, is a distinctive thing. It's not shared by everybody. How do you with integrity hold to that and yet, and yet affirm the unity of the body? I don't have a, a formulaic answer for that. Uh, at the end of this message, I'll give a few tips on an attitude. As I'm, I've been living in this, struggling with this, uh, and the more I've gotten clear about the, the, my convictions about the Anabaptist stream, the more urgent this question has become. Um, so I'll, I'll get to some attitudes that will help us to, uh, to wrestle through that. But I want to back into that by telling the story of how I, I evolved personally and how Woodland Hills Church evolved into this Anabaptist stream. And we're right now in the, in the process of trying to uh, decide where we're going to officially affiliate, uh, whether we're going to be uh, Mennonite or Brethren of Christ or both or neither. We don't know. But we're definitely Anabaptist. And here's how we got there. So in uh, 1974, uh, after three, four years of rather crazy drugs, sex, and rock and roll living, I uh, gave my life to Christ in this radical Pentecostal church. It was 39 years ago. <laughs> man, I can't believe that. 39 years ago. No wonder I'm going through menopause. <laughs> and and um, it was this radical church, that Pentecostal. I, I needed that, I think. Anything else would not have broken me out of my old lifestyle, but it was pretty crazy. But by, by 1980 or so, I had kind of migrated to what I would call mainstream evangelicalism. Mainstream American evangelicalism. That, that was the group that, that believed the things that I believed. I was a conservative Christian. Um, but even while I believed what that group believed, I wasn't always comfortable with that tribe. And it wasn't so much what they believed that I was uncomfortable with, but that something about the flavor of the thing was rubbing me wrong right from the start. Um, you know, there's... Um, in the 80s, this is when the moral majority was really rising to power. This was a movement in America that, that really was a political movement that kind of co-opted the Christian right, and they were trying to grab a lot of political power so they could have the righteous laws and the righteous candidates in, in place so that we could take America back for God. That was the, the movement there. And I wasn't so much opposed to the particular positions of the moral majority movement, but there's something about the style of it that was bothering me. So that's about the flavor of it, the attitude. It didn't seem like something Jesus would do. The attitude, there's a lot of hostility, animosity, this kind of conquest, militant, takeover thing. I just don't recall Jesus ever acting like that in the Gospels. And so I already was getting kind of hesitant, uh, disturbed by this evangelical movement. The, the, the slogan they used was, we got to take America back for God. And that always puzzled me. I, I've never been able to locate when those good old days were. I, I, I've tried. I, when, when was America under God, for God, uh, a distinctly Jesus-looking nation? Was that before or after the conquistadors came over and slaughtered millions of the natives and broke every treaty we ever made with them to steal the land? Were those the good old days we're trying to get back to? Because I don't think the American Indians would agree with that one. I mean, was it before or after? I'm kind of confused here. We imported uh, slaves from Africa for two centuries and got wealthy on the blood of their enslaved blacks. Were those uh, the, the good days we're trying to get back to, the glory days? Because I doubt the uh, African Americans would agree with that. Was it during the, the, the Revolutionary Wars when we had thousands of, of Christians on this continent fought, killing thousands of other Christians on a different continent over who's going to rule us, you know, the president or the, or, the, or the king? Are those the glory days we're truly trying to get back to? Because uh, I can't see it. And th that message is, sells a lot better up here in Canada than it does down in the States. I, I, I get a lot of pushback on that. But I was just genuinely confused. We're trying to take, go back to, no, go back to when? Because it's kind of been not Jesus looking all the way along. So I was uncomfortable. Uh, just not feeling like this is quite where I'm, I, I'm, I'm settled. Now this happened all throughout the 80s and into the 90s. We plant Woodland Hills Church in 1992, and though I was uncomfortable with the evangelical tribe, it is what I believed, and so uh, we were started as a Baptist evangelical American church. And there was a few things that were kind of distinct about us. We didn't have flags in the church uh, as a matter of principle, and we wouldn't jump on political bandwagons, and that's kind of unique for American evangelical churches. But by and large, we identify with that tribe. But my discomfort continued. And there's several things that happened in the 90s that kind of were turning events for me. I, I found that as I studied the scripture, I, I, I got to see with more and more clarity that 
The central thing is this thing called the kingdom of God or the reign of God. Jesus talks about it all the time. And evangelicalism, we didn't. We, we, we talked about this gospel of salvation where if you just believe you know, in Jesus, say the sinner's prayer, then that means you'll go to heaven instead of hell, and that's kind of it. And I began to see, just from my own reading and studying and dialoguing, that yeah, it's a whole, about a whole lot more than that. Um, this, this kingdom is about the reign of God now. It's about transformed lives now. It's about God changing the way things are now. And it won't be consummated until the future, but we're to be different now. And the clearer I got about the kingdom of God, the foggier I got about what relationship it had to do with what we were calling church. Uh, what I came to see is that, that the kingdom of God always looks like Jesus. Jesus incarnated God. He was the embodiment of God, right? Um, he's God incarnate. And so he's the kingdom of God incarnate, the reign of God incarnate. If you want to know what the kingdom looks like, if you want to know what it looks like when God rules in a, a human life 100%, look at Jesus. He's the walking, talking version of the kingdom of God. And so wherever the kingdom shows up, it's going to look like Jesus. Wherever the kingdom shows up, it'll be individually and corporately a, a group of people that are, are serving like Jesus and are humble like Jesus and are self-sacrificial like Jesus and who are caring for the poor like Jesus and who are just manifesting the character of God like Jesus. The kingdom of God is, by definition, Jesus-like. It looks like Jesus. That's why the church, which is called to manifest the kingdom of God, why we're called the body of Christ. We're to be doing, as a corporate body, exactly what Jesus did in his first body. He embodied the kingdom, and so we're to embody the kingdom. We're, like, we're to be like a giant Jesus. And, um, um, and, and so the way to know whether the kingdom of God is present is not to ask people what they believe. It's rather to watch how they are loving, how they are serving, how they are sacrificing. Are they putting on display the character of Abba, Father? Uh, that, that's the all-important criteria. John says in his first epistle, he says, whoever claims to live in Jesus must live like Jesus. I remember when I first saw that passage, it, it blew me away. Because this isn't praying the sinner's prayer to avoid hell. Whoever, if you're living in Jesus, and you're getting your life from Jesus, and your meaning is all wrapped up in Jesus, well, then you're going to be living like Jesus. You'll at least be moving in that direction. When you submit to the reign of God, he pours his DNA into your life. Something happens. Something changes. It's called the Holy Spirit, his DNA. So you begin to be transformed into the image of his son. You're part of Abba's family. You're born from above, the Bible says. And so I began to see that as important as beliefs are, as important as beliefs are, the kingdom of God is about more than beliefs. It's about growing in a Christ-like kind of a love. There's another time I remember, um, this is probably 1997 or 98, right around there. And have you ever had this experience where you've read a passage maybe a thousand times, but the time you read it for the thousand and one time, uh, it, it's like you've never read it before? It often comes alive. Uh, something about where you're at in your life, you just are able to receive a revelation from that passage that you couldn't see before. Well, that happened to me uh, several times, but the most important one was when I was reading Matthew chapter 5, around 97, 98, as I've been growing in this awareness of the kingdom of God. And here Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That phrase, that you may be, just hit me between the eyes. That you may be. Um, the implication is that this is the criteria for being a child of God. Um, You'll know the child of God by the distinct way that they can love. Whereas everybody loves their neighbors and, and, and their friends but hates their enemies, uh, in, in the kingdom, when you submit your life to, kingdom, you are in, to the king, you are empowered to love the way he loves. 
And he loves like the sun shines and like the rain falls. He loves indiscriminately. The sun doesn't choose where it's going to shine or who it's going to shine on. You don't see rays of light saying, nah, you don't deserve our light, but you do. And then, you know, kind of just choosing. If, no, the, the sun loves or shines indiscriminately. And rain falls indiscriminately. Rain, raindrops don't choose who deserves to get wet. They just, come, they just come down. Rain does what it does and the sun does what it does. And God does what he does. He loves. He just loves. And whether you deserve it or not is not the question. You don't, but he loves anyways. And when you submit to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you are empowered to love like that. So you don't just love your neighbors and those who benefit you. You love those who are your enemies. And when Jesus talks about enemies, in first century Palestine to Jews, the first thing that people are going to think of are the Romans. Those are the enemies. And the Romans are the ones who have conquered this land and are reigning on it unjustly, or they're, they're reigning with an oppressive rule. The Romans are the ones who sometimes round up your kids and sell them into slavery if you can't pay your debts. Romans are the ones who unjustly uh, make you do things and, and uh, overtax you. The Romans are the ones who sometimes will round up uh, hundreds, and in a few cases we know of thousands of innocent people, and crucify them just to flex their muscle because they can. They reign by terror. These are the first century terrorists. But these folks have already taken over the land. Over the, they're, they're ruling over the Jews, and the Jews hate it. The Romans are the one group that the Jews love to hate. They rally around their hatred for the Romans. And Jesus comes along and says, love your enemies. In fact, in the Lucan parallel, he says, do good to your enemies. It's not just a private emotion. You're supposed to act in ways. To love them is to act in ways that benefit them. See, this is one of the things that got Jesus crucified. It's a radical, radical message. It doesn't sell well to most people because it's not practical. But Jesus models it, and Jesus teaches it, and then he says, this is the criteria for being a child of God. You love like the Father loves. And love, folks, get this, love. People have a lot of different definitions of love. But the Bible tells us what genuine love is, what kingdom love is, by pointing us to the cross. John says, here's how you know what love is. Are you wondering what love is? Well, here's how you know. He doesn't give us an abstract definition. He points us to the cross. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That is love. Jesus Christ, God Almighty, set aside the prerogatives of his, his glory and gave his life for us. So also we should give our life for one another. Uh, he could have called legions of angels and he would have been justified in doing it, but he didn't. He allowed himself to be crucified for us. Peter was justified pulling out the sword and cutting off the guard's ear, but Jesus rebuked him. Uh, because out of love for us, he gave his life. So also, well, that's how we're to live. And we live in love to the degree that we do that. And the cross reveals the character of Abba Father. So living in a cross-like way, in a self-sacrificial way, serving even our enemies, loving like the sun shines and the rain falls, that is the ultimate criteria for what it is to be a child of God. And when I saw this, it changed everything. It just it, it began to blow my brain. Um, because if this is the criteria for being the, a child of God, well, then i got to ask the question, um, to what degree is the church today manifesting that character? And the clearer I got about the kingdom, the farther I got about the church, because I, while I see a lot of people professing Christianity and, and claiming to be right and trying to get power to rule over others and a lot of other things, what I don't see a lot of, praise God for the exceptions, but there's a lot of bodies that look like Jesus who are loving their enemies and laying down the sword and serving their enemies. This is the ultimate test for being a child of God. And so this, I came to see, is the ultimate test for being orthodox. The ultimate test, the most important test for orthodoxy, is not a particular thing that we believe, though beliefs are important. I'm not minimizing that at all. But it's are we living the way Jesus lived and are we sacrificing the way Jesus sacrificed? Are we, are we manifesting a cross-like kind of love? It's the ultimate test of orthodoxy. In fact, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, which we've heard at too many weddings, and so we think it's poetry, but this is the most radical, incredible verse of the Bible. He says um, that, that, that you can have all the right beliefs in the world, and beliefs are important, but if you're not motivated by love, and remember, love always looks like the cross, loving your enemies, then it's altogether worthless. 
And you can have the gift of tongues, and that's wonderful, and the gift of prophecy, fantastic. And you can know all mysteries, wonderful, and have all knowledge. Whoa, praise God. And you can even have faith that moves mountains, but if you're not motivated by a cross-like kind of love, for the purpose of manifesting a cross-like kind of love and furthering a cross-like kind of love, then Paul says it is a clinging symbol. It's just religious noise. It's just worthless trash. You can believe all the right things in the world, but if you're not motivated by love, it's altogether worthless. This is the all-important test of orthodoxy. Are we living in this kind of love? Are we living in this kind of love? Mind-blowing. In, in, in Galatians 5, he says that the only thing that matters is faith being energized by love. And love always looks like Calvary. I, I begin to wonder in the late 90s and now going into the third millennium, as I'm going in process on this, begin to wonder, how is it, how is it that, that if this is the ultimate test of orthodoxy, it's the all or nothing of the Christian life. Because if you have this, you, you have the essence of all you need. But if you don't have this, then it doesn't matter what else you have. It's altogether worthless. And I begin to wonder, how is it then that, that we have a history in the church? Ever since the church picked up the sword in the 5th century, when Constantine gave it all that power, and we put down the cross, and we picked up the sword, and we thought we were going to conquer the world in Jesus' name, and the church has been trying to do that ever since. How is it that throughout that history we find thousands, even millions of people being persecuted and martyred, beheaded, being burned alive and tortured in various ways because they were witches or because they were heretics or what have you? But there's, there's no official report that I've been able to find of anyone ever even just being rebuked for not loving enough. See, if this is the all-important test of orthodoxy, then to not love, is it not the worst heresy? Because if you're wrong on this point, it doesn't matter what else you're right on, you're wrong. This is the worst heresy. And so, you know, in the 1530s, uh, Calvin had Michael Servetus burned at the stake, burned alive, because he was wrong about the Trinity. And being wrong about the Trinity is a bad heresy, for sure. But who was more wrong? Michael Servetus for being wrong about the Trinity, or Calvin for missing out on love because he burned him alive. Uh, that's not loving. It seems to me that burning someone alive is the worst heresy. It's terrible to be wrong about the Trinity, but to fail to love is a far worse heresy. Terrible to be wrong about the incarnation, of the deity of Christ. Very important doctrine, but to be wrong uh, and, 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 and not loving enough, that's a far worse heresy. It's terrible to, to deny the, the inspiration of Scripture, but it's a far worse heresy to stop loving the person who denies the inspiration of Scripture or the Trinity or the Incarnation or what have you. This is the all-important all test of orthodoxy and therefore the all-important heresy. And um, as, as the clearer I got about this, the more confused I got about what church was all about. Uh, this was my journey into the stream of, of, of uh, the Anabaptist tradition. Because I discovered in 2006... This, uh, that I wasn't alone in seeing all this. I was starting to think I was crazy. And I probably am, but not for that reason. Uh, but I feel very alone. And then what happened is in 2006, I, I uh, published this book called uh, The uh, Myth of a Christian Nation. Um, it came out of a series that I did at my church where I really kind of got clear about all this, the way I'm being right now. And I had 1,000 people in my church leave, uh, which is fine. Uh, you know, we're not called to build bib, we're called to build quality. But, uh, yeah, it was, it, we call it the mass exodus. <laughs> That's my church shrinkage strategy. So um, th th this book came out as a result of that. And then what they did is it got me on the map of the Anabaptists, who started inviting me to uh, different conferences and churches to give talks because they recognized that in the kingdom that I was proclaiming, well, it's the kingdom that is their tradition for the last five centuries. Now, I didn't know who the Anabaptists were. I knew historically this group called the Anabaptists. But when I thought about Anabaptists, I thought about the Amish. I, Brethren in Christ, Mennonites, you know, I thought they were just the liberal Amish. You know, they, they got to wear white bonnets instead of black bonnets. I don't know. But, so that was my idea of what the, these, these Anabaptists are. And, and as I, over the last seven years, have had a chance to dialogue with this group, I've come to see that uh, it, it's, they're not at all just like the Amish. They're, they're as diverse as, as can be. But they all have this vision of the kingdom in common. And this I've identified as my tribe. They, 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 they get this kingdom distinctive. Um, and um, now I can point to a, a, a tradition in the past and say that represents the kingdom as I understand it, the kingdom that Jesus came uh, to inaugurate, in contrast to the institutional church, which has so often operated in, in different ways. Um, I initially, when I was getting all this growing towards this Anabaptist stream, I would minimize 
the distinctiveness of it uh, and emphasize more what, what, what Woodland Hills Church has in common with other churches. But I've now come to believe that the time has come to now emphasize the distinctness and to call upon other Anabaptists to, to do so. And here's why. The church militant and triumphant, that church that was created in the 5th century that picked up the sword, the church that was going to conquer the world in Jesus' name and still trying to grab on to power, that church has been dying. That model of the church has been dying for several centuries. Its last stronghold is America, and it's dying there too. And don't, don't grieve that loss because it's a good thing. Because out of the, the rubble, that, that had a veneer semblance of, of, of the kingdom, but the true kingdom looks very different from that because the true kingdom always looks like Calvary. And what we're seeing today is out of the rubble of this dismantling of Christendom is rising uh, all over the globe. I didn't know about it until 2006. All over the place, people are getting a, this vision. They're getting that, what Jesus came to do, and it always has this humble, humble servant, self-sacrificial feel to it. And, and these folks are looking for, like I have been, looking for a tribe and a tradition. Something that anchor this witness in the past. And the only folks who have the tradition are the Anabaptists, the Brethren in Christ, the Mennonites. And so my message to the Mennonites and the other Anabaptist groups has been this. Uh, God's doing a new thing in this world, pouring out new wineskin, and people are looking for a tribe and a tradition that they can call home, and the only ones who have it are you guys. That stream of the Christian tradition that people are looking for, you have it. And so this is the time to grab hold and passionately proclaim that vision of the kingdom that, that your forefathers gave you five, 500 years ago. Uh, and at the same time, uh, to open your arms to embrace a, a, the widest diversity of cultures that you can imagine. So many Anabaptists are locked in their own little cultural settings uh, that they, they, they have trouble relating to people of other cultures. And I'm saying, if you can let go of that cultural stuff and embrace people from a wide variety of cultures and, and, and proclaim that kingdom, don't walk away from it, don't water it down, uh, then you are positioned, I believe, to be used by God in the most beautiful, radical powerful way imaginable and to see a revival like, like you, you've never seen before. I really think that we're positioned in that. That's why the Meeting House in Woodland Hills, we've been talking a lot about what is our responsibility to this rising revolution, uh, to be able to help other Anabaptist groups welcome these folks in. It's an exciting, exciting time. But it raises this question, uh, and it's the question we started with. While we have this kingdom distinctive, we also have to affirm the church universal, the one church, the church in all of its diversity. And so how do we proclaim, passionately proclaim, this beautiful Jesus-looking cross-like kingdom that few others have ever been willing to embrace? How do we do that and yet maintain this attitude of, of, and work for the, the, the bond of peace and the unity of the church? It's not, I don't believe, by watering down the distinctive. I don't believe that. The church needs us to boldly proclaim that distinctive. It's been missing for far too long. Uh, the, the church, people, the world needs people to proclaim an alternative to this model of the church that so many have rejected. I, I don't know how it is here in Canada, but I suspect it's not all that different from America, where there are, there are tons of people who think they've rejected Jesus because they rejected the church. But the reasons they rejected the church are perfectly legitimate reasons for rejecting the church. It's because the church deserved to be rejected. It was ugly. It was intolerant. It was judgmental. It was trying to be controlling. And, and now I find the best apologetic strategy in, in, in the, being an evangelist is to not try to defend the church against criticisms, but to side with the unbeliever in the criticisms against the church and say, yeah, you know what, it's even worse than that. But then to show them that it has nothing to do with Jesus, because the kingdom that Jesus brought is altogether different from that. Uh, and it opens the door for people to come into what they were rejecting was not the kingdom, but just a, 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 a church that, that only bore a, a vague resemblance to the kingdom. We need to boldly proclaim this kingdom, not water it down. But here's the thing. Here's what keeps the bond of unity. As Woodland Hills uh, is, is trying to be more out loud about this distinctive and, and uh, uh, no longer trying to minimize it, we wrestle with this kind of question. But here's, here's where we're at. Because we are called to manifest the kingdom, and the kingdom always looks like Jesus, the kingdom can never be arrogant. Uh, it can never be self-righteous. In fact, Jesus says, don't judge if you don't want to be judged. Why do you look for the speck in your neighbor's eye when you've got a log in your own eye? And what Jesus is getting at there is he's simply prescribing for us an attitude to have. 
is this. Whatever sin you think you see or whatever fault you think you see in somebody else, consider that to be so small compared to the log sin or log fault that you have in your own eye. Yours is massively worse, in other words. Paul makes the same point when he said, here's a, here's a worthy saying, a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. This should be accepted by everyone, Paul says. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Now, logically, you can't have everybody being the worst. That's a superlative. You can only have one. Uh, but he's not trying to give us a, you know, let's have a contest at who's the worst sinner. I probably would win that one. But he's saying, here's the attitude that all kingdom people should have. Jesus came to say, all of us are sinners saved by grace, and I am the worst. Because that collapses our judgment mechanism. See, it would be impossible, impossible to adhere to these teachings and become arrogant. To adhere to these teachings and, 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 and live in a, the humble kingdom and, and yet become self-righteous because you think you know something someone else doesn't know. If we, if we have a kingdom mindset, then we would go into this. The last thing we would ever do is, is think of ourselves as some kind of holy club. Especially if we realize that the true kingdom is not first and foremost about beliefs, but about how we love. Because there are folks in every stream of the Christian tradition who love more than we do. We don't live up to our own, our, our own kingdom calling. And there are folks in the Anabaptist stream who, who don't live in that kind of love. And so the last thing we can do is set ourselves up as some kind of a holy club, or we got a corner on truth, or we're God's special people, or any of that other nonsense. No, it, it, if we are going to really be doing this in a kingdom way... We do it in a humble way where we say, look, at, here's how we see Scripture. Here's, here's what we think God has shown us. And we are honest with our distinctives, and we're passionate about it. At the same time, we realize that we're the worst of sinners, and we don't live up to our own calling, and we don't have a corner on the truth. And so we sit at the feet of others and say, will you teach us as we teach you? Uh, we offer what we have, but you offer what you have. This is why I love your one church series. It's beautiful. You listen to other voices. And you'll learn things. They've got stuff to teach you, and I believe we've got something to teach them. But see, we trust that God is at work in all those different streams, and that's how God is now bringing his bride, recovering his bride, restoring his bride, making his bride ready. And we all have a role to play in it. So hold fast to those distinctives. Passionately hold on to those distinctives. They're beautiful. They're important. But always remember that you are the worst of sinners, and so am I. And so we can never become arrogant about that. It's not an idol. Okay, uh, we got time for a few questions, I believe. Do we not? Do we not have time for maybe one or two? I don't know. Uh, it says I got three seconds left. <laughs> well, uh, we got time for one or two, don't we? Uh, here, let's just follow the spirit, and then when they drop the cage, they drop it. Here we go. Are you seeing the Anabaptist traditions cutting across social, economic, racial lines in the U.S.? Mm. Yes, yes. Um, they are, uh, and this is kind of a new thing because uh, for, uh, for far too long, Anabaptists have tended to be sort of in an enclave. They got their own little farming communities. They're sort of re retreatist, a little bit like the Amish. Um, but the, the new thing that's happening is that, uh, among the Mennonites anyways, I, I know more about them statistically than the Brethren of Christ, but the, the churches that are growing, and certainly growing the fastest, are the indigenous churches and the ten ones that tend to be uh, uh, in, in uh, the inner city and among the poor. Globally, it's, whoa, way diverse. I mean, it, it's incredible. So, yeah, it is cutting across all sorts of racial, ethnic uh, lines. It's, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. I hope that it, it continues. Let's do one more, just for the fun of it. I'm sorry, I, I, should, I should have saved more time. I, 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 I didn't, but I'm bad. I'm the worst of sinners. Did I tell you that? I am. I really am. <laughs> I agree that we are called to be one body, one church. With that said, why are there still people within the church that are feeling lonely and abandoned? Bingo. Uh, yeah, this is, this, is, this is not about an ideology unity, that you're, the question. It's about how do we function as one body. And here is where, and I love the way Meeting House is doing this, to manifest the true unity of the Spirit, you need more than a weekend event to do that. Uh, where you come together and 99% of the people don't know 99% of the other people. That's just what it is. That's a weekend event. But we need to be in tighter communities. I love your midweek uh, uh, meeting houses. And that's where you develop relationships and where you care for one another and do the, all the one another's of the New Testament. That's, that's what that, that's about. And that's the only cure for loneliness. You can't cure loneliness with an ideology or a philosophy or a theology. You cure it with relationships. And all of us need to be in those kind of kingdom relationships. Praise God. Hold fast to your distinctive kingdom of God, loving like Jesus loves even enemies. Embrace folks from all diversity of backgrounds 
and do it with a humility, knowing that you are the worst of sinners. Father, I thank you for this group in Jesus' name and for all who will hear this message by other venues. Uh, God, I just pray blessing on the meeting house. Use them, grow them, infuse them with your passion, Lord. And I, I, I pray, God, that as we leave here, uh, we'll do it with a, a fire burning in us uh, to live in the love of Jesus Christ, to manifest the unique and distinctly beautiful kingdom, to put on display the character of Abba Father, and to keep the bond of unity uh, that is fostered in humility. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for having me. I'll see you later. Bye. Peace.